Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners working with older adults be the best they can be. And now your host, Mandy Chamberlain. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about Seniors Flourish's sponsor, Great Seminars and Books. What I really like is that their mission is focusing on geriatric rehabilitation education and training for clinicians, which, as you know, is near and dear to my heart. They have great live courses focusing on topics such as clinical orthopedics, cancer rehab, or even topics such as clinical neurology. There is a course for anyone looking for evidence-based practice and treatment ideas while working with the older adult population. These are definitely some topics that I am interested in, and I think you should check them out too. So head on over to SeniorRehabProject.com backslash great and use my promo code SRP25 to get $25 off your next course. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast. My name is Manny Chamberlain. I'm an occupational therapist. And if you're new to the Seniors Flourish podcast, welcome. Um, I run SeniorsFlourish.com. I also run the Learning Lab, which is a membership site just for OT practitioners looking for a little bit more mentorship, um, treatment ideas, journal club, and lots and lots of other things. Um, so that's a little bit about me. So glad you found me. Um, today's topic is virtual reality and neuro rehab, which is a really, I think it's going to be a great topic because I have very little experience, um, personally in it, but there's a lot emerge, a lot of emerging research on it and how we can integrate that, those techniques with our neuro patients is really, really exciting. And today, um, I have Lauren Sheehan and she's an occupational therapist. So welcome, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Super excited. I love hearing about people's OT journeys. So let's get a little bit of background on yours. Yes. Um, well, I am actually brand new to this position and, and to kind of the world of OT meets tech. Um, but it's been a dream of mine, and, and I'm excited to have uh, sort of created the position through my experience. But I'll start at the beginning. Um, I've been an OT for about 10 years. And uh, have always really been attracted to neuro, neuro rehab, um, brain science, how patients recover from stroke, how they get back to um, what it is that they enjoy, and really being kind of their problem-solving partner in that whole process. So um, I had worked about five years in an outpatient neuro setting um, doing a multitude of different things, but, uh, had tried to, as much as I could kind of learn about different tools, um, to assist the patients in their recovery and always sort of felt like, gosh, there's not, well, there's never going to be a perfect fit, but, um, on the outpatient side, especially when patients are continuing this trajectory for recovery, which is so long, as you and your listeners know. I mean, these people are just rehabbing for a very long time, and it's a long and drawn-out process, and it's really easy to get frustrated and disengaged. And I would find that my patients would, you know, have great intentions, and then they'd go home and just other things would get in the way, and they wouldn't get a chance to do their upper extremity work or whatever it was. So I've mm-hmm. always been like, you know, there's got to be something else out there. Um, I took a little break from kind of direct uh, neuro-based practice, and I've been in administration and, and supervisory roles the last five years, um, which I think has really grown kind of my business sense and that side of my brain. Um, and then <clears throat> I was doing some private practice with a neuro patient just to keep my hand on the pulse, um, and he... Uh, happened to have been a programmer, as many folks are out here in Seattle, um, <laughs> and has had been a game programmer, actually. Um, had a stroke at a really young age in his 40s. And again, we were kind of stuck with, like, what can we... He was really past his OT outpatient time um, and visits and things had um, elapsed. And just looking for something to engage him. And his wife actually, as a great advocate for him, found this device um, called the Smart Glove. 
um, which is through a company called Neofect, which is now my employer. Um, and it's, uh, it's a virtual reality based, um, glove upper extremity rehab system, pretty simple, um, but has some evaluation properties as well as engaging with, um, games and ADL tasks in this kind of virtual reality world. And he just fell in love with like, A, I think, you know, occupationally it was something that was meaningful to him and B, he was super engaged. And I just saw how, um, that was one possible way to fill the gap for these patients who, are really looking for something to keep them involved in their rehab long-term because it is such a long-term process. And he was excited about it and he, he wanted to do it and he was able to stick with it. Um, and so at the time the company was fairly new. They're actually based out of South Korea, um, and didn't have any OTs on staff. And so we just started a conversation. They started asking me to um, give some feedback on some of their beta stuff. And we just continued talking. And I said at one point, you know, what would it look like um, for me to come on board? I think you guys need an OT. Um, There's this great technology for patients with strokes and brain injuries and and other neurologic issues. And gosh, um, OT could really provide a lot to um, how to bridge the gap between what clinicians need, how to bring this to the the patients that need it, and how to continue to develop the product. So that's kind of how I landed in my my current role, my title, which who knows, it's really an evolving uh, evolving (laughs) piece right now, but is clinical manager. So I'll be I'll be sort of that a gap filler between, you know, what does the product look like? What does it mean to clinicians? What feedback are we getting? How can we continue to develop in a way that makes sense for the patient and for the clinic and, um, and really meet the needs of patients? So I'm just super stoked. It's been a crazy journey, but, um, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of these sorts of industries that are trying to do good and, and meet the needs of patients, but they need our they need our um, expertise and what we bring to the table is so important. So I'm not in a clinic, but I feel like I get to kind of touch all of the different pieces of how this product will reach patients. And I'm just super excited. That sounds super exciting. It's just really neat to see the tech world and rehab, you know, combining to do best, to have best practice for our patients. It's, you know, like just all the research and talking about the neuroplasticity of the brain and how do we best tap into that is such a neat um, thing. And I think it's such a progressive way way to um, mesh the two um, areas and provide absolutely best practice. Um, And what's meaningful for the patient. I mean, like you found something that's exactly meaningful for the patient. Um, he enjoys it. He's motivated by it. And it just makes such a difference. Right, right. Our tools have changed. You know, we're doing the same kind of work and we have the same background and we have the expertise in brain science and that's, you know, always evolving. But I think to really be effective as a profession and as professionals, we need to understand what tools are at our disposal and the disposal of patients. And, you know, I think patients can be really great. In this example, they brought this tool to me. And I think a lot of our patients bring the tools to us. But I think as as clinicians, you know, how can we make sure that we understand what tools are available um, and find the right fit for our patients? And I think this is just another yeah. potential tool, as we always like to talk about tools in our yeah. toolkit. And it's and it's an exciting one. It really is. Yeah. I mean, there's high tech virtual reality and there's low tech virtual reality. Um, what is your experience? Or I mean, mm-hmm. even if you haven't had that experience, what do you see out there as some different types of technology, virtual reality that we can be using with our patients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll give a definition first, just because I think it's, it's important to kind of encapsulate what it is. Yeah. So, um, VR, virtual reality, a lot of times you'll hear in the tech community, it's called VR or just shortened that way. Um, but it's basically, it's computer based. So there's some kind of computer interface going on, right? It's interactive. Um, so the patient is um, able to participate in whatever scenario, game, world, 
um, context is created. Um, and it's multi-sensory. So those are kind of the things that, that set it apart. You get visual information. Often there's a biofeedback component, um, you know, telling the patient or giving sensory information about whether or not the patient is interacting in the way that's intended, right? Are they reaching the target? Are they, um, are they moving their arm, you know, in a fluid line, whatever it is that the goal is? So those are kind of the, the three pieces. And then that it occurs in real time. So that, again, that feedback piece to the patient um, is happening in real time. Um, and the biggest thing I think that it allows for, and then I can definitely talk through some of the, the stuff that's out there right now, but is that users, patients, participants, um, can engage in activities with environments that appear similar to real world objects and events. I think as OTs and, and as an OT, you know, in multiple settings, it's always hard to find kind of that context, right? We always have this like bag of stuff that we're carrying around or bringing in things from home. And we're always trying to find that right fit for the occupation of our patients. And again, to engage them and make sure that it's it's occupation-driven and something that aligns with their goals. But what's cool about virtual reality is that it, we can create in maybe a little easier way without all of our backpack of stuff all the time in just a different way, I think, like a context that's really meaningful to them. Um, I absolutely agree. It's those things that, like, make it fun and like I said, make it meaningful. Right. I was checking out that, um, your website, the company website the other day, and it had one of those. Yeah. And the effect. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, one of those, you know, the activities was pouring a glass yep. of wine into, a, you know, wine into a glass. And I'm yep. like, that yeah. would be really fun and super meaningful to me anyway. Right. Well, and you know, <laughs> I was just demoing, I was just demoing the product yesterday at a stroke, um, awareness yeah. fair at the VA in Seattle here and people were eating it up, but like that really gets people. They're like, you know, yeah. there's a fishing game on there, which the vets were really enjoying. It's just trying to make sure that, and there's a lot that's ADL based and some that's a little bit more kind of gamified, but yes, pouring wine, shoot, if I have a stroke or something <laughs> happens to me, like I will gravitate toward Something like that, right? you know, it's just, and then it opens up conversation, um, about the lives of our clients and the things that they're, that they find important. So, so yeah, that's kind of the, the background a little bit of, of virtual reality, but I think where it really probably started and we started to see this idea in the clinic was with the, we, with the, we, and with the connect, um, these systems that are pretty accessible to patients and fun and engaging. And there's like an element of, you know, winning or um, there's some kind of end game, which is, I think, really motivational to folks. Um, so those are maybe the, the more low tech. Um, the things that are starting to emerge now, um, like the smart glove with the Neofect company, um, the music glove, which is a with um, Flint Rehab, uh, Fit Me, which is also a Flint Rehab um, device, and these will all be in um, in the the handout or the additional information that you provide to listeners. But um, is that there's a lot of great measurement tools that we're starting to find being integrated into these virtual reality products, um, which allows us as the OT an ability to say, you know how is the patient progressing? What is this actually making a difference? We're an outcomes-based, outcomes-driven world that we should be. We need to, you know, really um, make sure that what we're doing has efficacy and, and is showing improvement for our patients. And I think different than some of the lower tech tools um, that that are kind of off the shelf, so to speak, um, like the Wii, these newer emerging products really allow us to do that, to take an assessment. Um, so for the, the smart glove, um, for example, there's an evaluation tool, um, before a patient even gets in and gets to start kind of, uh, going through the world of the different games and, and virtual reality activities, um, they have an evaluation. So there's passive range of motion, active range of motion. And then within the games, they also are looking at timing, coordination, 
Um, Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to understand, you know, how the patient is at a snapshot before they begin. And then um, every 30 days, automatically the system requests um, an evaluation and you can reevaluate any time. And then it graphs that over time. So you can see, you know, gosh, is there an area where maybe a patient's plateauing in a certain movement? Um, what's really been working for them? What are they engaged in. Uh, And a lot of the new technologies are starting to do that. So that just gives us another way to make sure that we're assessing and speaking to um, outcomes. So I mentioned the music glove. um, That that really is more for fine motor. So smart glove um, tends to be uh, accessible, available to patients with a little less um, active range of motion. So the patient that I first was um, introduced to the system through was pretty flaccid. I mean, definitely had some emerging supination, pronation, um, activation of flexion, um, but kind of your standard just emerging and starting to see some gravity eliminated motion. So, and he was able to be really successful with the device. The smart or the um, music glove requires lateral pinch in order to participate, but is really more kind of a fine motor activity. And the the platform looks a lot like kind of like Guitar Hero, if you've ever played that before. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that really works on the coordination and timing of, of pinch and of um, opposition and fine motor activity. And then um, the Fit Me is um, actually has these two pucks. They're, they look like little hockey pucks almost. Um, and there are different activities and exercises that have to do with, again, coordination and timing. It's kind of interesting because you can put them anywhere. You can do like my, by manual tasks with them. Um, you can um, put them on the table for reaching. So there's a little bit of, um, you can kind of change it up with that particular device. And then Sabo um, at AOTA this year, There was a lot that was being exhibited for VR, and Sabo has a new VR system that, again, uses kind of the Kinect-style camera and things um, and has uh, an ADL. It's almost like an ADL um, island, so there's, like, different things that the patient can do, um, pet care and um, gardening and... So that one really focuses more on, I think, kind of upper extremity and total um, mobility and motion. Uh, And I don't think it's quite released yet, but it's coming um, very soon. Those are the things that are super intriguing to me because it is not something that I could ever, ever do. Um, So (laughs) I think about how challenging it is. And um, I think it's the way of the future. It's, it's good for us to be able to document these um, changes. And it's those little things that I think really make a difference to our patients and the quality of life to our patients. But sometimes it's hard to document the things that we see and things that we know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I know when I first started out, you're, you're just trying to like, how do I put down on paper what I see? Um, those little, little changes, those you know, quality of movement versus, um, functional gains. I don't know. It's just changes. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just trying to get it down on paper and like, make sure that we can document it appropriately. Most definitely. And sometimes it's small and it's, yeah, it's very difficult to put it into those objective measures. Yep. And I think that's the advantage, um, one of the advantages at least, of virtual reality, that we can use that to justify to our patients, to our payer sources, to, yeah. um, you know, everyone per se, I guess, um, that we are making those gains right. um, on those, especially when those gains are so, so small. So I think it's really um, a good objective way to help us out as well. I agree. I agree. Because so much of what we see in, in neuro rehab um, and upper extremity progress over time is improvement in the quality of movement. And it's really difficult yeah. to quantify quality. 
um, which, you know, some of these systems allow us to tap into coordination and timing and speed and number of repetitions within a session and some of those things that we can say, okay, you know, if the patient's able to do more repetitions and more accurate repetitions, then we can speak to the fact that they're reaching the target more often and they're, you know, more successful, um, which, you know, I definitely want to speak to as well that this this is a tool and, a, and an adjunctive method, but we Absolutely. always want to be translating it to, okay, well, how does that actually move them to do something more functional in their everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think my, I find one of my hardest part are things to kind of establish. I don't really know much about objective member member measurements um, of a quality of movement. Um, you know, there's lots of things about fine motor and coordination and speed. Um, but I find quality of movement more objective and, you know, patient reporting and that kind of thing, which is great. You know, it's helpful and people say like, oh, I can do this better. Um, right. But really having a tool to actually help assess that um, and document that yeah. is very, very helpful. I think those are the things that um, we struggle with, the things that right. we struggle with, we can use those types of tools to just make it easier um, to, like I said before, justify it to the you know insurance companies and make sure that we are making progress. Um, yeah, definitely. And you know, helping the patient like we want to. Okay, so let's talk about, you said that um, virtual reality can help with things like quality of movement, coordination, right. Right. Um, fine gross motor coordination. What are some other areas that you see virtual reality um, helping, helping with, um, with our patients in neural setting? You know, for, for the products that I'm familiar with, um, many of them have a mm-hmm. cognitive component as well. Um, okay. And so there are pieces of attention, like for my patient, for example, that um, first started with the smart glove device, um, actually being able to participate and sustain attention through a task. And it happened to be working on his upper extremity with this device, but was a really big deal. Like one of the reasons that we were having such a hard time getting repetitions in and that mass practice for the intensity of upper extremity work that we wanted him to do was that we just couldn't sustain his attention for a length of time to get that good mass practice going. So I think attention is, is huge and that sustained attention, um, visual motor, visual spatial components, um, often exist because this is a, a multi-sensory product or device. Um, so we can be looking at, you know, matching and, um, different, visual, cognitive, spatial, uh, tasks, as well as like we talked about the quality of movement and the repetitions, which are really the biggest ways to capitalize on, on neuroplasticity. I think it's interesting, um, just because I've been geeking out on the research lately. (laughs) Uh, you are totally not alone. I love geeking out on research Um, too. (laughs) When it comes to what an outpatient OT session usually looks like, and I just thought this was fascinating. Um, usually only 36 minutes of a 45 minute session are actually spent on activity, which makes sense. You know, we're like getting patients to the gym and chatting with them and transferring. And, you know, so we already are slimmed down from what the intent of the session is. And and we're already strapped for time as, as everyone knows that works in an outpatient setting. Um, and then when we're focusing on upper extremity improvement specifically, so if I bring a patient to my clinic and I, you know, okay, this is going to be an upper extremity session. Maybe we're working on a specific reaching task or trying to elicit some tricep extension for, um, a smoother, um, reach patterns and, as they looked at 
um, a number of different sessions, you know, combining and, and contrasting that information, only about 32 repetitions were completed during that time frame of the 36 minutes of a session. And it's like, wow. yeah, but a little bit um, disheartening because I think we, we don't, we think as OTs that we're doing a lot more within those sessions, um, but there's just so much to focus on. So um, I think the, the outcomes piece is really driving that additional intensity through a home program, which is really the only way that we can keep these patients um, doing the intensive practice that's needed for, especially for upper extremity return and improvement. Um, and we just, we can't do it all within the clinic. And I think we sometimes want to think that we can, uh, right. but we just, we need other tools. Yeah. So, for example, how do you incorporate virtual reality into practice? Mm -hmm. Or how do you integrate that into, like, your treatment plans? Like, what you are doing with your patients every sure, day? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think it depends on what what the outcome, desired outcome is. Um, for the patient that... Um, I've worked with most intensively with the device, we would typically um, warm up doing some other kinds of things to reduce tone. So um, he also has a BioNest device. Sometimes we would start with just um, really using some electrical stimulation, get that hand open, kind of get uh, get the, the system calmed down a little bit in terms of sp spasticity. Um, and do some good prep work. So that or weight bearing, really just preparatory, get in the right mind frame, get that arm, some proprioceptive input, let's kind of get it ready to go. And then okay, we yeah. would um, spend, because he was so engaged in using the, the smart glove, we would spend um, at least 30 minutes um, when we were together using the device. Typically on his own, he would spend more um, time than that if he was okay. able. And then we always tried to end with a functional activity. So preparatory, let's get, you know, engaged in doing these multiple kind of mass practice repetition, get it in. Um, and then let's see how that translates to function. So let's choose something. Um, one of the things that actually is a, an activity you may have seen in the smart glove program is turning pages of a book. Um, and then we put that to practice, like, okay, so we practiced this a bunch of times. We really worked on the quality of the movement. Let's actually see how this yeah. translates. How does it work for, for you? And can you do it effectively? And yeah. so I think that's how it fits for probably most of these systems. That's how I would see best practice. You know, we're, we're using the other tools that we know about and things that we know are effective, um, weight bearing, electrical stimulation, some of that preparatory stuff using this as kind of a little interim. And then how do we make sure that it, it really does, um, translate to function? Yeah, definitely. Is there a best practice or how much they should actually be using it in the home? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, <laughs> you know, it really, it really is. And it's so up to the patient's tolerance. Um, yeah. my recommendation, and it's sort of along the lines of a constraint induced model, um, yeah. is to try and get five days a week, at least a half hour, but like an yeah. hour if patients can do it. Um, more is really better when it comes to that, especially that early window of neuroplasticity and, and um, stroke recovery. So, uh, you know, that that's really my recommendation. One of the cool things that we're doing um, with Neofect is creating a clinician platform that would allow clinicians to log in sort of behind the scenes and sort of scope out what the patients are really doing. So you bring them into the clinic and you're checking in with them on their program. They're using the smart glove, you know, Hey John, have you gotten a chance to follow through on that program that we talked about? You know, we're really trying to get that intensive practice in. Um, let's look at what your sessions over the last week have looked like. Oh, 15 minutes, you know, yeah. just, just to open that dialogue because, um, 
again, I think it's it's so hard to be on the outpatient side and the patients are well-intentioned and, oh, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing Absolutely. everything you've asked. Yep. Yeah, sometimes right. you're trying to like, right. oh, are you really doing it? <laughs> Those kinds of things. Absolutely. But, you know, um, you know, it might hold that little bit of extra accountability um, depending on the patient's deficits. Yeah. Um, you know, do they have initiation? Yeah. Um, do they have, um, you know, can they, can they actually participate in that? Yeah, do they have somebody that can set them up? I mean, it, it's a pretty easy set up. We actually got the, the patient that I was working with um, to be able to put his glove on, take it off all by himself, no problem. So he could do he could do it when there wasn't anyone at home. We um, we got him setting an alarm for himself, you know, just all those reinforcement pieces to try and really make sure that um, we could engage him as much as, as, as possible. But I agree. I think when people are out on their own and especially when some cognitive challenges are at play. Um, best laid plans don't always happen. And so, yeah, how can we, how can we work together and, and partner with our patients to make sure that they're really doing what they want to do um, to continue their stroke recovery? Yeah, it's definitely, definitely a team approach. Yeah. I mean, we can do everything that we can to make sure to get over their barriers, um, making sure right. they can get it on on their own, making sure we can, you know, they can use it effectively, try to encourage them, tell, give them all the steps and tools, you know, but most definitely, yeah, you know, yeah. do what you can, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So do you know anything about insurance or anything about like reimbursement in use of this tool? Yeah. Good, good question. Um, the evidence is definitely mounting. I mean, we're seeing more, um, evidence that, Again, get this as a tool can help um, get the repetitions in to improve um, improve function. Um, we, as as a company, and I don't know of any right now. Um, so most of these are cash based um, programs. Many of the virtual reality programs, especially the higher tech, which we didn't talk about as much, but like the um, the robotics oriented, so like right. Hokoma, some of the other um, robotics upper extremity virtual reality products are, you know, definitely a clinical unit. Um, but the home units often are cash based. I think we have a really unique model. Um, and I've heard it from patients as well, um, which is $99 a month and it's rental. Uh, so if somebody, you know, it fills the gap for a little while, maybe they sort of grow out of it and they don't need it anymore. Then they're not stuck with something that's, you know, sitting in a closet somewhere. Um, yeah, I know the Music Love and the Fit Me are both um, cash-based purchases. Um, uh, it just probably just yeah, really just depends. kind of off the top. It does. It does. Yeah. I mean, like I think with more research to back it up and show the prevalence and show the uh, sorry, show the um, you know the the research that supports it and make a difference. Um, we used to not get tens paid for a tens unit, and now then they did. Well, now sometimes they don't, but like at least you know that there was if there's research to support it, and that it was a right um, a practice that was helpful to the patients. You know, things yeah, change. it's an evolution, absolutely. Yeah, so we'll be we'll be working on that, but we didn't want that to be you know a a stopping point for um, providing it to patients and. You know, we're seeing more and more of these home units um, kind of come through. There's a, one of the robotics companies is coming out with a home unit um, as well that was introduced at AOTA along with the Sabo. So there's more of these virtual reality solutions kind of coming to the market um, for the home. So I think strength in numbers, you know, as, as more of us sort of come to the market and realize that this is uh, a way to help provide that motivation to patients in the home um, that we'll, we'll just have to see kind of how it unfolds. But um, yeah, for right now it is primarily cash based. Yeah. What do you think the future of virtual reality is going to be? I mean, there's so much out there. <laughs> I know. And I mean, now that you're venturing yeah. into this area, like where do you, where do you see it going? Any ideas? There are, there are. We're starting to, I mean, there definitely are other applications besides, um, besides the neuro population. I, I know, um, 
some of the headsets and kind of the immersive virtual reality, there's talk about using, and I, and I know that it is being used. I don't know how many OTs are. I'd be curious if any of your listeners have right. um, this background, but uh, using it for PTSD and sort of creating, you know, these scenarios where um, we can start to um, talk through mental health issues with some of our patients and, mm-hmm. and create the setting to do that. Um, I know the military uses it a lot for training exercises. Um, so, you know, I, I think the world is really open right now as far as, gosh, what could we use it for simulation and return to work for patients? Could we use it for, um, any number of different things. I just think there's there's a lot that we will see continue to evolve in our lifetime. And I think that OT will continue to get closer um, to being at the forefront and, and participating in developing this, these technologies that are, um, that are going to help people that we serve. So it's an exciting time. Yeah, I think there's just so many applications that it potentially could... Um, be used for you know you don't I don't know if I've seen a lot of research on it but like um, you see articles and people talking about it but like things like you know pain control um, I think that could be really a useful tool for that population or um, Mm -hmm. you see people or those virtual reality goggles um, for people with dementia or you know PTSD or I think trying to think of a couple other examples Um, you know biofeedback we use a lower level of virtual reality for that, or even, you know, anxiety. I think there's just so many applications. And if our goal is to help our patients participate in the occupations that are meaningful to them, it's just going to be a part of occupational therapy. And it's just going to expand and grow. And it's just an exciting time to be an OT in this time of technology and growth. It is. And I think there was really good energy around that at the AOTA conference this year as well. Um, the Eleanor Clark mm-hmm. legal lecture w- was really technology based yeah. and, and really spoke to, you know, who else, who else can we interface with? How can we make sure that we put our stamp, um, and very uniquely, you know, we're looking at the environment, the person, their motivation, yeah. their fit, their desires, their abilities, um, and participating and interacting with the world. And how can we, how can we put our stamp on, we we don't stand alone. And I think that's becoming more and more clear, um, especially as technology evolves and, and different industries that we can really partner with to, um, to make sure that people, um, that have injuries, illnesses, limitations, um, get to participate in the way that's most meaningful to them. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, I think we will see a lot more partnerships, um, and collaborations evolve over the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being here today. Um, I'm going to put in the show notes, um, some of that occupational therapy and virtual reality research that we were kind of talking about. And and also just some resources and um, of some websites for some virtual reality gloves and things like that. Um, And then uh, Lauren has put together a PDF for everyone. Yeah, so I'll be um, speaking to the products that I had mentioned, and there'll be links to find them. And please, if there's others that you are aware of that I may not be, um, you know, feel free to share that with the Seniors Flourish community. And um, just trying to make sure that we have the knowledge about what's out there and, and what's available to us and our patients. I really appreciate you being here today, Lauren. Great topic. Yeah. Thanks, Mandy. It was a great time. Appreciate it. No problem. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Hi, guys. Don't forget to check out the live courses from my sponsor, Great Seminars and Books. I love the variety of courses they offer, specifically because they are relevant to the populations that we are working with every day, older adults. And their topics include things such as home health, a specialty course of its own, and clinical implications of pharmacology for the therapist working with the older adult. So all these topics are relevant 
evidence-based, and very practical. These are treatments that you can learn in the course and take back and use right away. So head on over to SeniorRehabProject.com backslash great and use my promo code SRP25 so you can get $25 off your next live course. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at SeniorRehabProject.com. Thank you.